These ninjas were so vicious that when the band found out that their instruments was missing, them niggas was like, what? What happened? What happened? Oh, they stole your instruments? That's up. Oh, my God. Who do that? Who do that? Who do that? Who would steal somebody's instruments like that? Who would do that? Who would do that? Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5. You babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about David Ritz and Eddie James's uh, race to survive the Eddie James story. I think this is part 14 or 15. He also has a drag queen friend by the name of Destiny, okay? Destiny approached her one day at a show and said, girl, can you tell me? How you're keeping off all this weight? Etta James said, sure, I'm on a dope fiend diet. Her Judy, the drag queen, what's the girl named Destiny? She said, okay, well, let's be on a dope fiend diet together. Destiny would cruise the bus stations on Tuesday nights. She never detailed her sex life like Miss Dakota, my other close drag queen friend who I'll tell you about later. But Destiny never lied about her nature. She wasn't at all ashamed or conflicted, just horny. And like me, she loved getting high. I was with Destiny when I got busted in Indianapolis. They wrote up a story in the Jet Magazine. Jet Magazine, you a nigga. Ray Charles had just been busted there by the same cops who hassled us. I think that's one of the reasons Ray and I always got along. As fellow junkies, we understood each other. I remember this time at the Sutherland Hotel in Chicago. I was coming out of my room just when Ray was getting out of the elevator. I just watched him. Didn't say a word. Didn't want him to know I, I was there. I just wanted to watch him take his sharp little military turns as he hurried down the hallway carefully counting his steps, feeling along the walls until he reached his room. Ray Charles, I finally said, man, you something else. He snapped back with, hey, Etta, how you doing, baby? Ray hadn't heard my voice in at least two years, but he recognized me like we'd been talking every day. He's that sharp. In Indianapolis, I was pretty dull. We were in the motel where they found heroin. Esther Phillips was with us, but she claimed to be just passing through. Esther girl, everybody know that you was a junkie. According to the Etta James, she said uh, Esther would not acknowledge her drug use, okay? Despite everybody looking at her shooting dope, knowing that she was back in that room nodding off with the rest of the damn junkies but esther phillips was like uh-uh no not me that's no no i'm too good for the junkies uh-uh you leave that up to the junkies i don't do that they threw me and destiny in the fish tank john lewis was able to bribe us out for a thousand dollars but on the stipulation that we spend some time in jail for cohabitation now this is the bullshit in indiana you were not supposed to be in a hotel room together or a man and woman was not supposed to be in a hotel room together unless they was married. I said, oh, shit. I was in Chicago desperate for a fix. 
John Lewis was out of town. John Lewis always kept me and his wife Artie in dope. Above his fatherly advice, John did two things for me. Supply me with heroin and get me gigs. And when I had to choose between the two, I'd put dope purse, any junkie would. And that's just what I'd become, a junkie. There are people who can be cool with their habit, people who can keep it under control, people who might even live long lives while secretly tooting or shooting on special occasions. But such people are rare. Most addicts are like me. Gotta have it. Give it to me. Give it to me now. In the early 60s, I had a first-hand look at the ravages of heroin. Two of my band members died of an overdose right in front of my face. In the recent past, I got in a new band. John Lewis loved to manipulate schedules and manage musicians. And during a down period for the Midnighters, he hired them to play behind me. They worked out of Atlanta, where they'd hooked up with a group of black school teachers, bougie sisters, with nice pads who housed the guys when they weren't working. Mel Brown, famous for the Funky Onion, was on guitar. Killer Joe, my boyfriend at the time, was on drums. Jimmy Johnson played keyboards. Cat, we call PPP, Pimpin' Pat Patterson, was from Pittsburgh, and he blew that trumpet. Cat was going with Arlene, my traveling companion who'd been tricking in Harlem on 126th Street from behind the Apollo, a wild country girl turned street. Arlene was crazy in love with Pat. Butch Navarro was the bassist at the time. Butch was a notorious junkie for Jersey who become a Muslim in Atlanta. Let me tell you this right quick, okay? The dude Butch came from the same, um, or got his ex at the same place that she got her ex from, okay? Because remember, uh, she had, uh, was deemed Muslim by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Muslims had convinced her to marry this girl, right? The girl was already pregnant when they got married, okay? And then when the girl when the girl had the baby, the baby came out mulatto, right? So the poor man Butchie, okay, he found out on a humble that okay, this girl has somebody else's baby and the baby is a white man baby okay the dude butchie was so mad that he beat the game anyway girl, so getting back to the midnighters the midnighters band started out with me in california we played the hideaway on la cienega and adams i was closing just as aretha franklin was opening that was when aretha was still on columbia records signing or singing running out of fools she said that she bumped into Aretha, who was there with her husband, Ted White. Teddy Pimpy Whitey girl. I love how all these um, books just come with them. Y'all, these damn cicadas, y'all. Oh, my God. Girls. I bumped into Aretha, who was there with her husband, Teddy Pimpy Whitey. And we chatted a while. Me and Reed had lots in common. We both started out in church, and now we're singing for the world. There was always an unspoken understanding between us. We allowed ourselves to be used. We were attracted to cats who pretended to be protective but saw us as property. Cats who didn't think twice about messing up a young chick's life. Seems like if me and Aretha had sat down and talked, I would have said, girl, what are you doing being ruled and run by these clowns? What do you mean? What, what, Ada, I'm lost. What do you mean, what are you doing? Y'all both are being ran by fools. Y'all both are, first of all, no, 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 no. You both had poor taste in men, okay? But she ain't got junkie on top of it. I'm just saying. This was also the time my feelings for heroin were getting extra compulsive. I hit a dry period. I was sick 80% of the time, sick of running the streets, looking to cop. If I actually managed to get high the other 20% of the time, I'd be lucky. One of the times I was sick coincided with Aretha's appearance at the hideaway. Along with Ted White, Aretha bought along her daddy. I learned this when I was laying up in my suite at the walk-in suffering something terrible. She said because... 
Aretha was there with her daddy. Her daddy came in the room, stroked her head. Hey, child. Hello, child. Okay, I heard about you. You're sick in the head. You know, you're dealing with the junkie blues. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All I can do is, you know, pray away the junkie blues. Oh, baby. The little girl is scared of the cicadas. I don't blame you, boo. I, I moved, moved back to the fort, still having problems scoring dope. John Lewis and I were having problems. We had a couple of bad arguments. I was so hard-headed, no one could really handle me. And I told him, look, man, you work for me. I can fire your ass. John Lewis looked at her ass and said, look, bitch, fire me? I do two things for you. I get you gigs and dope. You want to talk to me? Okay. Where pin at? Where pin? Oh, my God. The baby got a cicada on his head. Oh, shit. It's a cicada on his head. And his mom. Oh, Lord. Uh, it's your baby got a cicada on his head, girl. Oh, there you go. He finally kicked it off. He Next finally... thing I knew, John went to play with one of his girlfriends in New York. I was still scrambling for smack. Now, dig this. Because she round here still itching and scratching for that damn dope. You know, and, you know, she knew that John was in charge of getting her gigs and dope. Right. What happened was she called John. Look, John, look. Look, I know we've been having our issues, baby, but listen, I, I got an issue. I got an issue. John said, yeah, I know you'll be back. Guess what? I got something hidden underneath the rock in the front of the house. She went there, wasn't there. Oh, it ain't there? It ain't there? Okay, we'll try, you know, in the mailbox. I got something for you there. It ain't there, John. It ain't there. Well, baby, if it ain't there, I ain't got nothing to tell you. I knew John was bullshitting. I thought this was my punishment for firing him. But the real punishment came the next day. When I heard a loud knock at the door, I peeked out the window and saw all kinds of cop cars parked out front. Yes. Okay. That motherfucker John must have been a Scorpio or a Virgo. You heard me. That damn John Lewis. Oh my God. Ain't no revenge like that Scorpio revenge. You heard me. Oh my God. So anyway, she done got her a little bag of dope. Okay. Child, she getting ready to, you know, chop it up and fix it, you know, flip it, make pancakes out of it, whatever them dope heads be doing, okay, or whatever them junkies be doing. I don't have no, I listen, I'm just joking, I don't have no issues with y'all because like I said, I understand how people get, you know, take a perk set, next minute you know you buying dope, you know, on the street. I understand how you go from one to another. Right. What happened was, she in the house fixing her dope up, right, all of a sudden, she look out the window. She's like, fuck. Damn cops. Come on, get her. She finally let the dude in. Okay? They start searching the house. I heard it was some dope around here. I heard it's some dope in the house. How you hear that? The police said, oh, some dude in New York told us that you had dope in the house. Okay? Eddie didn't want to think that her old friend slash ex-manager had turned her in and um, dropped the dime on her, but who else would it have been? They said some dude in New York. John is in New York with one of his hoes. My okay. attorney, Richard Fuslier, had the case thrown out. He proved illegal search and seizure. Pure and simple. John denied that he set me up. Later, John and I made up. I guess we realized we needed each other. And when it was time to leave L.A. for my first road trip with the Midnighters Band, John came along. I asked Butch Navarro to drive my new Cadillac, a baby blue Fleetwood. Butchie, don't forget Butchie, is the dude that the Muslims had, uh, you know, turned his life around, okay? Married woman, you know, he used to be on a jug, you know, itching and a scratching. The Muslims say, okay, we're going to get you clean off the jug, and we're going to marry you to this bitch that's already pregnant by a white man. Okay. She on this trip, right? They on the road together. The dude, Butchie, is the uh, driver, right? Butchie is clean. But the other mother, as a junkie, is trying to look out for Butchie. Okay, that's not something that junkies always do. You know, sometimes junkies want to drag you to the depths of hell with but them. this right? time... What? And, but this time, Etta was like, no, I'm not going to do this to this man, right? So they on a, a junkie hunt, okay? They didn't found him some good, good, you know, white stuff somewhere, right? Uh, John stuck it up his nose and was like, listen, 
This is real good, serious, heavy stuff. Okay, y'all take it easy with that. So I guess John was the kind of person that can pick it up and put it down. Anyway, John took his little thing up the nose, went to bed and said, you know, you niggas, y'all need to slow down and be careful with this because this is serious. Adam was like, Butch, you know, maybe you shouldn't watch me, you know, get high. Maybe you shouldn't watch me do this, right? But she was like, I'm good, I'm good, right? At around there nodding off, you know, she looked up. Next minute, you know, you see Butchie over there, he turned one off, okay? It was so strong for him. Because remember, he ain't got high in years because he didn't gave his life over to the Muslims, right? He took that stuff. They thought his ass was dying. You heard me? Because he OD'd. And that's what I think kind of what happened with DMX. DMX didn't get high for a long time. And then just that temptation was there. He took it. And whatever it is he took it, it was just too strong. For Seconds him. later, Butch killed over. We got scared. Butch, Butch. We started yelling, get up. Killer Joe picked up and put him on the bed. I hit him across the face with a wet towel. I heard him say, oh God. Oh no, I said, this man has done OD, his eyes opened. We urged him to go to the room he shared with John Lewis and try to go to sleep. What? Now they tell him, Butchie, Butchie, go, go in the room, go in the bedroom, go to sleep. Okay, because that's all you want to do anything when you're a junkie. You just want to go to fuck to sleep, be left alone to enjoy the high. They right? thinking that Butchie is gone in the room, but when they looked out the window, they see Butchie outside with the people that's getting ready to go to the, the church, okay? He outside in the damn, um, on the Cadillac, leaning over, like he fitting to crawl into the trunk, okay? They run outside to get the nigga. Finally, we got Butch up to John's room and left him there. By then, he seemed all right. He wasn't. When he got in bed, John said he started hollering for God to forgive him for kicking his Muslim wife's ass. Then his eyes snapped open. John gave him one of his vicious back slaps, the kind he used to wake us up with in the morning. Butch didn't move. Not only with that good juggy that they had gotten, you know, on the road there, they lost Butchie, but they also just lost the bass player messing around with that good juggy. They knew it was foul play. There were needle marks all over the bodies. But John, being a Mason and a Texan, offered his best bullshit, and it worked. We weren't taken in. In fact, the autopsy didn't reveal any traces of heroin. Maybe the salt neutralized it. Who knows? I was, dev I was devastated. I paid for Butch's body to be flown back to Jersey and paid for the funeral, but knew it would be a mess since he had two wives and two families. When we got to Atlanta, I had to hire bodyguards so Work. you know why she needed bodyguards because what you don't do is with the muslims okay the muslims cleaned that boy up they took all his time their time to make him good make him marry that good woman who was pregnant by that good white man okay and then you're gonna fuck him up so of course she had to hire bodyguards because you know them muslims don't play okay you can't come in and just you know mess up all that work not long after at the Cecil Hotel in Harlem, John Lewis came to my room and said, you've just lost your tenor player. He was talking about Spike Jones, a jazz saxist who'd been working with us. John found him dead in the bed. Spike was replaced by J.C. Davis, who'd been James Brown's band leader. That's when James hired Maceo Parker to take J.C.'s place. JC was sick of James's fines. I was sick from not having enough smack, which is when John and I did something I'm not proud of. John was the mastermind, but I was the eager accomplice. As long as you got that shiz, oh my God, you good. Okay, but when you ain't got it, that's something different. So okay. when she said that's something she's not proud of, I was like, well, boy, Etta, what the hell did you do, Etta? It ain't much more that you can do. Well, John right? came up with a plan, okay? Let's steal the band's instruments and pawn them so we can get high. These ninjas were so vicious that when the band found out that their instruments was missing, them niggas was like, what? What happened? What happened? Oh, they stole your instruments? That's up. Oh my God. Who do that? Who do that? Who do that? 
Who would steal somebody instruments like that? Who would do that? Who would do that? On this cold afternoon in Chicago, I was caught shorthanded. I needed a fix and John was nowhere to be found. Me and his wife Artie were both strung out something fierce. There was another guy in the building, an old man in his 80s named Fred, who was a drug dealer. Him and John were partners. Call Fred, urged Artie. I did, but Fred said he wasn't holding. I called Fred back and said, have a heart, man. We're sick. Please give me some of what you got. Fred said, come on over. Oh, my God. Oh, she said, old ass Fred was sitting in his easy chair watching all my children in General Hospital, okay? Sitting there with his robe on and his titties barely showing through the robe, okay? In a pair of silk boxers in his easy chair, okay? You can see his gray dick and balls hanging out of the bottom of the boxes. Those are some long balls. I told you, man, I don't know why the hell you old ass men try to get with these young girls. If you think these young girls can't see them long ass gray balls, you, you got the world after. Edda, looking at him, say, oh shit. I know where this is going. Mm-hmm. This is going, baby. This is going. Basically, the old man said, you want some of this juggy, baby? Well, you're going to have to get with the program. She imagined dropping to her knees, sucking on them long balls, and damn near threw up in her mouth. Okay? She said she couldn't do it. I could not do it. I'm not about to suck this old man dick. Wait a minute. So you can steal from your own band, but you can't suck an old man. the catalyst. Etta wants to get clean now. Remember to like, share to Facebook, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. Now remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. Naysayers, my patron loves you babies. Have a good one.